Welcome to the Word of Life Center podcast. It's our desire that today's message would equip and empower you to see the Word of God bring life to your life. Just say this, we are uh, in this series, as you know, it's called Better. And uh, the, the, the focus of it is uh, making sure that we're getting better at what matters the most and, and talking a lot about prayer and fasting because we want to get better. We want to get better at prayer. We want to get better at fasting. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. As a matter of fact, I've, I've already heard. I got a text this morning about uh, just something that God has done because of prayer. Someone was believing God for just the right job, and guess what happened? They went to work today, this morning, was their first day on the job. Praise God because of prayer. Amen. <laughs> It's just been hearing around the church people talking about what they're believing God for in this season of prayer and fasting, that for clarity concerning some steps that they need to take, some doors to open or maybe close. And so it's exciting. Uh, and listen, when we talk about getting better at prayer, we're not talking about um, getting better in the sense of uh, praying more eloquently. You know, it's, it's, I mean, have you been around some people, you're like, man, I wish I could pray like they pray. I mean, it's just like so beautiful and so fluid. And so it's just awesome. And, and then, and then you're like, okay, God, I'm going to try, you know, I hope this works kind of a thing. And, but, but here's, here's the deal. It, it's not about eloquence. It's not what we're shooting for. It's about effectiveness. It's not about eloquence. It's about effectiveness. That, that, that that's what it's about. When we're talking about getting better at prayer, And fasting, that's what we're talking about. It's not being more eloquent. It's not like that God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the Trinity's in heaven, and they grade our prayers like, that was a three. Could you try it again? (laughs) And we're trying to work up to that 10, you know, and that's not it. But but, but we want to get better at being effective because um, when we pray, when we pray, what happens is this, uh, when it gives God access, and whenever God gets access, he's going to influence, and whenever his influence hits a moment or hits a situation or hits a circumstance, his influence or his power causes things to shift or things to change. So prayer, prayer, the reason we want to get better and, and causing our prayers to be effective is because, because um, uh, go with God, with God, if he can just get a shot, if he can just have access, his influence is going to bring some big differences in and through us. Amen. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, a few months ago, uh, my, my, my wife and I, Sandy and I, uh, took my parents down to, uh, to, to New Orleans. As a matter of fact, we were uh, at, at, at on a holiday with them just a few weeks before, maybe a few months before. My dad just mentioned something. He said, well, you know, I just really like to go to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. He said, I just don't like the traffic and all that. So because I'm the most favored son among the Welch brothers, <laughs> just a joke, <laughs> really not but anyway, it's it's i i just called him a little bit uh you know later a few weeks later i said hey dad you know it's when we're still living in lake charles i said won't you mom and dad just come down why don't you come down and, and we'll take you to uh, we'll take you i'll just drive you to new orleans we'll go to the world war ii museum he's a history buff plus plus his father and my mom's dad both were in world war ii He's a veteran. Uh, I'm a veteran. My brother's a, uh, a veteran. We're all combat veterans. And so it just runs in our family. So it was a great, great experience go to the war, going to the World War II Museum. If you like things like that, I would highly encourage you, if you're ever in the area of New Orleans, make sure you go by that museum. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. World War II Museum. So we're walking through the museum. And um, I was reminded, I was reminded of this special weapon that uh, America had in World War II. And it was deployed, it was deployed in the, in the, uh, in the Pacific region, in the Pacific theater, where we were, where we were fighting the Japanese. You probably know the history. Uh, in World War II, we and, and our allies were fighting on two different fronts in the European theater and also in the Pacific theater. But America deployed a very, very special um, tool, a very special weapon and it had great uh, power. It was very, very effective. And, and as, I, as I looked at it, you know, I, had, I remembered it. And I, I, I thought, you know what? That, that weapon that was deployed, it wasn't bombs. And it, and, it, and, it, and it wasn't any type of a chemical. It had nothing to do with bullets. But, but actually, it was, it was a language. It was a language that was deployed, that was used in the Pacific theater. And, and, and it won, and because of, this, because of this weapon, this language, from a certain group of soldiers in the United States uh, Marines, it turned the tide in the Pacific theater, and it gave us great victory over our enemies. 
<laughs> and you're like, well, what was it? What kind of language was it? I'm going to leave you hanging for a minute. <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight about prayer. I'll give you a few scriptures about prayer. Here's one of my favorites, James 5, 17 and 18. James 5, 17 and 18. We're going to talk about prayer tonight. Talk about prayer, hooking up uh, and continuing on with the thought about getting better, 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 better. And what matters the most in regards to prayer and fasting. James 5, 17 and 18 says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. Think about that. Elijah was a human being. When you think about Elijah, you think about all, he's a, he was a prophet, great man of God, did tremendous things, amazing things. One of the things that he did, he was really, really effective in prayer. But, but look, look what, what James included, Pastor James included. He says, Elijah was a human being. In other words, he was a human being just like us, even as we are. But he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. Here's the point that I want to make about this scripture. We have the same opportunities as the heroes of the faith do. We have the same opportunities. Elijah prayed and things happened. And we look at that and we go, but that was Elijah. That was a spiritual giant. That was a, that was a hero of the faith. But here, James said, Elijah was a man just like we are. He was a human just like we are. So if, it, if prayer worked for James, excuse me, if prayer worked for Elijah, I believe prayer could also work for what? For, for us. How many could use some changes? <laughs> How I many could you use some shifts in your life? Here's another, here's another great scripture concerning prayer. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, This is the confidence that we have approaching God. This is the confidence that we have approaching God. One of the things that we want to walk away from with this series is this, is that we want to have a confidence. Getting better at what matters the most in prayer, prayer and praying. We want to be confident in our prayer life. Can somebody say amen to that? Let me say it even better than that. We want to be confident in, that when we begin to pray that something is going to happen. When we begin to pray, we want to have the confidence that when we begin to pray, that gives access to God. And when God has access, he influences. And when he influences, something is going to change. Can somebody say amen to that in regards to just being confident in that? That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Isn't that awesome? To have that kind of confidence. So prayer shouldn't be, here's the point that I want to make. Prayer shouldn't be our, uh, excuse me, prayer shouldn't be our last resort, but it should be our first response. Why? Because we're so confident. When something's up or we just need something to move in our life, it it, it shouldn't be our last resort, but it should be our first response to that thing or that moment or whatever's going on. We just need to go, you know what? Here's here's how we're going to start this thing. We're going to pray. And we're confident that God is going to move and God is going to to do something amazing. This past Sunday, we looked at 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 an incredible event that took place in Jesus' ministry. It's the, it's the, the moment that, that, that um, a gentleman by the name of, um, what was his name? Bartimaeus just left me. Don't be offended, Bart. Uh, the moment that, that, that Bartimaeus received his sight, and we looked at that, and we, we, we said, uh, looked at that moment. We, we, we used our imaginations. We stepped back in time, and we used our imaginations, and we, we said, well, what, what, did we, what would we have seen in that moment when Bartimaeus, when he is calling out to Jesus? What, what would that have been? And, and, and we, we, re- we recognize, we realize that we would have seen passion. We would have seen persistence. And, and we would have seen the fact that Bartimaeus was precise. And we said, well, what if we took that same attitude and translated that over into our prayer life? And then we determined in our mind that we were going to be passionate about prayer. And what does that mean? What does that mean? Again, that means we're going to be passionate about prayer. That means it's not going to be the last resort is going to be the first thing that we do because we believe in prayer amen but we also saw this we saw the attitude that he had that he he, that Bartimaeus was just persistent and then how that we too can be persistent in prayer and I'm going to we're going to unpack this one in just a moment because I really felt like for tonight we needed to unpack that that one word persistent and we're going to dig into that one but we also saw the word precise 
We saw that attitude in Bartimaeus, that, that he was precise. When Jesus called him and Bartimaeus came to, uh, came to Jesus, Jesus said, Bartimaeus, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? And he was very precise. We said this, we need to be precise in regards to what we ask God for. We, we just can't go to God and say, God, thy will be done. No, no. He wants to know what do you want? What do you want me to do in your life? You're giving me access to influence, but what do you want me to influence in your life? So we talked also about a couple of roadblocks, going back to persistent, because I want to unpack that. I feel like God wanted us to unpack this one tonight. The Holy Spirit wanted us to unpack this one. A couple of roadblocks to pers- being persistent. Once we talked about this one on Sunday, and that is prediction. Pre- uh, persistence. The greatest en- one of the greatest enemies of persistence is prediction. Simply what that means is, is that when we begin to pray, we can get in trouble if we try to predict as to how God is going to answer the prayer. We, in other words, we frame it in our mind and we believe God is going to work this way because we're praying. But I can tell you uh, so many times in my life that, 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 that I, I, would put, I would put God in this box saying, God, I believe you're going to move this way when I pray. Only to realize <laughs> he's not going to get in John's box. And John's mind can't even comprehend the ways that God can answer my prayers. And how that it's important that we need to determine in our heart and our minds that something that we need to add to our prayer life is God, help me recognize the answers when you roll them into my life. Because what can happen is, is, is that if God doesn't move within our framework, we just stop and we give up and we give in. And we say, God, you're not working in my life. What is it? Well, you're working in other people's life. Well, well, maybe if you just would have hung in there a little bit longer, or maybe, maybe, maybe if you just wouldn't have determined how he was going to work and begin to say, God, just help me see the answer. I know that it's coming. I know that it's coming. I know that it's coming. And I'm not going to quit till I see it. What would happen? So prediction can be a, a, a roadblock. But, but here, here's, another, uh, here's another one that can be a roadblock to persistence. You got, your, you got your ears to hear? Are they on this evening? All right. Here's another roadblock. It's understanding. Or the lack of understanding. So, so, so what happens when we come to a place where we don't know how to pray? In other words, we want to be persistent. We, we want to grab a hold of something and not turn loose. And we're going to hang in there and we're going to hold on. We're going to pray and we're going to contend for God with God, not with God. We're going to contend for God's answer. We're going to hang in there to, uh, to, 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 to do that through prayer. And we're in there. We're in there. We're with it. We're with it. We're being persistent. But what happens when we come to a point where like, I'm just out. I, I don't even know. I don't even know how to pray anymore. But yet, but yet. I know God has an answer, but I, 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 what, what, what do I do? Because I haven't seen God. I haven't seen the answer yet. What, what, what do I do? Well, so the answer is this. The answer is this. You have to shift your method. You have to shift your method. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15, Paul talks about two methods of prayer. He says, for I pray in a tongue... My spirit prays, and my mind is unfruitful. Watch this, verse 15. So what shall I do? I'll pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my what? My two methods of prayer. He said this. Again, he said, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but also pray with my what? My one translation says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my, what? my mind, my understanding. Here's the point. There are times when we're praying that we can pray with our understanding. We're praying with our understanding. We're praying with our understanding. But, and it's working. We know that and we can be confident in that. But there can be times that the enemy, the enemy can come in there and he can throw seeds of doubt to, to make you, uh, to lure you in to thinking your prayer's not working. How many believe that the enemy hates it when we pray? <laughs> he hates it. In other words, that's the reason he hates his 21 days of prayer and fasting. 
right? That's because he knows something is up. Amen. Watch this. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I also sing with my understanding. These two methods. Number one is to pray with your understanding. How do you do that? How do you pray with your understanding? How, how do I do that? How do I pray? Method number one. How do I pray with my understanding? It's very, very easy. You pray the word of God. Can I have a better amen than that? So whatever you're dealing with, whatever you need, what you need to do is you need to go and find out what God's word says about it. For example, people before have asked me over the years, they said, well, pastor, how can we pray for you? One of my answers that I always give is that uh, pray for me in regards to wisdom. That's what I want. I want wisdom. You know why? Because that's something that I pray for all the time. God, give me wisdom. Because the Bible says in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives it generously without finding fault, and it'll be given to you. So th- this, this, is what, this is what I do. So when I'm, I, I hit a moment or hit a situation, and I, I, I see it, and I know I need to pray about it, I don't know what to do. One of the first things I do is I quote James chapter 1. Father, your word says... Father, this is what your word says. Now, listen, it's not that I'm reminding God. It's like God would go, I didn't know my word said that. No, 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 that's not, that's not what it is. What, what I'm doing is, or what a believer is doing at that moment, is that they are aligning themselves with the will of God. It's alignment. I'm aligning myself. We're aligning. We're bringing our soul. We're bringing our soul into alignment, our thinking, our believing into alignment. Father, your word says... If any man like wisdom, let him ask that you give it. Let him ask in faith and you give it in a way that doesn't embarrass and humiliate it. And you give it generously. Father, I just love you and I thank you for giving me wisdom. Just love it, Father. I thank you that you're giving me wisdom and, and, and just keep standing, keep praying, keep thanking him for it. Amen. You want healing? You want healing? You believe in God for healing? You know what you need to do? Go get you some scriptures on healing. Align your prayers. Will you under, align your prayer. Are you with me? Align it. For your finances, what do you do? Number one, you start tithing. <laughs> start there, right? And then, and then you, you, begin to, you begin to align. You take other scriptures, Philippians 4.19. I believe that my God meets and supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus. Father, I just thank you. All my needs are met in the name of Jesus. Amen? That's, that's, that's method number one. And you know what? Anybody can do that. Everybody can do that, can't you? You can go find you a promise, and you can stand on that promise, and you can align your will with that promise, and you can begin to pray that promise. Everybody can do that. Isn't that right? It's just not that hard. Amen? So what I do is that I use the language. I use my language to release my faith, my learned language. I, I use that. I use my learned language. But there are times, there are times, you're like, man, I just, I, I've, I've prayed every scripture, Father. <laughs> I've prayed every one of them. But you know that I, you just still need to be persistent. You just don't need to stop. You just don't need to back up. You ever been there? Just like, oh, I just want to keep praying. What do you do? Well, you shift over to method number two. Aren't you thankful for method number two? You say, well, some of you already know what it is. It's praying in the spirit it's praying in tongues how many are thankful in this house i said how many are thankful in this house that we can pray in the spirit (laughs) aren't you thankful that god did not take away what he gave the early church you do realize we're part of the same church. We're, we're part of the same church. It's not a different church. It may be a different generation, but it's the same, under the same dispensation. Can I have a better amen than that? Amen. We're part of the same church. And so method number two, Paul, Paul talked about it. He said, I pray with my mind. I pray with my what? My what? My understanding. And I release that with my language. But the, the method number two, he said, I pray with my spirit. 
I pray with my spirit. You see, when you were created, when you, when you were created, God created you this way, that you were created with a soul. It's your mind, will, and emotions. It's what your understanding is. It's what Paul was referring to a moment ago in method number one. But the, the Bible also says that you are created in the image of God. Therefore, you are a what? You are a spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people get freaked out. They're like, Whoa. Woo, what are you talking about? Well, if God is a spirit, we're creating his image, then we are what? A spirit. And we also just live in a what? We live in a body. Yeah. That, that, that's, the reason, that's the reason that folks that folks that are saved and a family member passes away, they handle that passing better than those who are not saved. Because they know that tavern, that, that, that body that's there, their family member is not there. You got it? So man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. And the moment you get born again, there is a connection made in your spirit. Your spirit comes alive with the life of God. And there is a supernatural connection there with the Holy Spirit. Aren't you thankful for the new birth? Aren't you thankful for that connection on the inside of you? The Holy Spirit is hooked up with you. Hallelujah. So Paul said that I pray with my understanding, but I also pray with my, my spirit. Which means that there is another language that is available to Christians, to believers who will embrace the, the gift of, and the preciousness, the precious gift of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. There's another language. Come, everybody say that with me. Say, there's another language. All right, hold that thought real quick. So what happens when a Christian begins to pray in tongues? What happens when a Christian begins to pray in the Spirit? If you're taking notes, write this down. What happens when a Christian uh, prays in the Spirit? Number one, the Holy Spirit comes to help. That's what happens. But listen, we're talking about getting better at prayer getting more confident in prayer. So what happens to a, when a Christian begins to pray is that the Holy Spirit, he steps in and he helps. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, very familiar scripture to a lot of folks in the room, but you need to hear it again, amen? Romans eight twenty six says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. What is that weakness? We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless what? groans. In the same way, the Spirit comes and does what? He helps us. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is, is not just a doer for us. The Holy Spirit is a helper matter of fact you study it in the greek the, oh, the overall meaning of the word it means one who comes along beside to do what to help that is the reason in john chapter 14 jesus is talking to the disciples and and, and the disciples were freaking out because Jesus is telling them, he's saying to them, look, I'm leaving this earth. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm not going to be with you long. And they are just flipping out. They are freaking out because Jesus is leaving them. Why, is G why are they so distraught? Why are they so upset? They are upset because Jesus helped them. So that's the reason Jesus in John 14, 16, 17 says, he says, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another who? What? Another what? And that he may abide in you forever, the spirit of truth, whom, you, uh, whom, whom the world cannot receive, uh, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, watch this, for he dwells with you and be, will be what? But what did Jesus say? He what? He dwells what? And he will be what? <laughs> One of the best ways to understand what the Holy Spirit is like is to go and, and read and see how Jesus interacted with his disciples. Because Jesus was anointed of the Holy Spirit and Jesus was a helper to the disciples. Are you following me? Let me give you an example. He wasn't necessarily a doer, but he's also a helper. I'll give you an example. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Or it says Jesus fed the 5,000. Remember that? 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rock your world a little bit when I say this. Jesus didn't feed the 5,000. The disciples fed the 5,000. You, you, remember, you remember Jesus looked at the crowds. The disciples are looking at the crowds. And the disciples come over to Jesus and Jesus, these folks are hungry. <laughs> we need to send them away so they can go get them something to eat. Go send them to, you know, go, let them go get a Happy Meal, God. Some Wendy's. I should stop talking about food since we're fasting. <laughs> But, but you know how Jesus responded to them? No, 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 no. They don't have to go anywhere. You're going to feed them. <laughs> Us? Do you not see how many people are out there, Jesus? And Jesus said, no, no, no. You're going to feed them. And they said, but Jesus, we don't have enough money to do that. And Jesus said, no, no. You, you're still going to help them. You're still going to feed them. So, so Jesus said, what do you got? Got some bread. Got a few fish. Jesus said, give it to me. Jesus blessed it. Broke it. And did what? He handed it to the disciples, and the disciples did what? They fed the 5,000. What did Jesus do? Jesus, in that moment, took a hold with them. Are you following this? And he helped them. He did something for them that they couldn't do on their own. Let me say it this way. He did something with them that they couldn't do on their own. That's the reason the disciples would just freak out. Because they're going to like, who's going to help us feed the 5,000 if we have to do that again? Who's going to, have to, who's going to help us do this stuff? And Jesus said, look, don't, 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 get, don't sweat it. I'm going to send you another helper. And he's going to not just be with you. He's going to be what? In you. Everybody say, thank God for the Holy Spirit that lives in me. So when a Christian prays, there's also alignment that takes place. When a Christian prays in the spirit, when a Christian prays in tongue, there's alignment. Alignment. And it's, the, it's alignment. What we mean by that, it's the perfect will of God is being voiced. Everybody listen to me. And Satan hates this. Romans 8, 27, it says, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to what? The will of what? God. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, If we ask anything according to his will, he what? He If he asks anything according to his will, he what? He hears us. Now back to the, the store of the World War II Museum. So we're walking through there, and I remembered, um, when I saw this, I remembered this, this display of these soldiers, this special weapon, I should say, which were, were a group of soldiers. And what, what had happened was in the, in the Pacific Theater, there were the, the Japanese were breaking our codes. So, so when we were trying to communicate, the Marines were trying to communicate between the two, the, the, the Japanese were, were listening in on the codes, and they were breaking our codes. So we were in trouble. So what happened was the Marines called on a special group of soldiers. They were the Navajo Indians. They were the Navajo Indians. And so they gathered the soldiers together and they they said, look, we want you to use your language because nobody else in the world knows your language and you come up with a code for communication. And these group of soldiers came up with a code and they began, they were a special unit that the Marines used. And it was a, it was a turn. It was a, there was a shift in the Pacific theater when these soldiers began to communicate using a language that the Japanese, the enemies could not break. There was a shift that took place. Most historians agree that because of this language, this special weapon that was deployed, it wasn't bullets, it wasn't bombs, it was a language. And because of that language, there was a major shift and it caused America to overcome in the Pacific theater. Here's the point that I'm making here. 
When a Christian begins to pray in the Spirit, what happens is there's a language that he that, that person begins to speak. It's not English. It's not Italian. It's not a known language. It is a prayer language from heaven. And it may sound just like a bunch of fumbled up words and strange words if someone's standing nearby. But what happens is when a person, when a Christian begins to pray and they begin to pray in the Spirit, what happens is, is that, that, that there is a language that's being released and in that language God's perfect will is being voiced. God doesn't hear any jumbled up words. What God hears is his perfect will being voiced. It's a language that he understands and it's a language that he responds to. (laughs) And Satan hates it. You know why? Because he can't break the code. He can't break the code. He cannot break the code. You see, when we pray in our understanding, he he can hear what's being said. That's the reason the thoughts of, of unbelief can come. I'm telling you, when you shift over to the other method and you begin to pray in the spirit and you begin to pray in tongues, what happens is he has no idea. He has no idea what's being spoken. But all, but, the, what, what, but that doesn't matter. What matters is God knows what's being said. And it's alignment. There's an alignment. The Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit knows the exact and the perfect will of God. That's the reason, that's the reason Satan has worked overtime in the church He's worked overtime in the church convincing folks that tongues aren't for today. Let me ask you a question. Why would God the Father give the early church, the church that we are a part of today, that privilege and that weapon and that gift, but not give it to us? Why? Because you remember Paul said, Romans chapter 8, he said, when we don't know how to pray as far as we should, we're at a place of weakness. Right? So the early church could shift. The early church could shift over to the other, me- uh, the other method and pray in the spirit. Well, I just believe we can too. I said, I believe we can too. Amen. Amen. So there's alignment that takes place. When we begin to pray in tongues, we begin to pray in the spirit. To wrap up this evening, when a Christian prays in the spirit, when a Christian prays in tongues, God responds. He responds. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 starts out like this. It starts out with the word and. We know that all things work for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. I hear that scripture quoted a lot. Just saying, well, in general... God works, works everything out for the will of, I mean, for the good of those who love him are called according to his purpose. But they're living off, often they leave off their first word. It's and. So that because of that word and, it's a conjunction, that means it's connected with the previous thoughts. Are you following me? Where Paul said, when a person, when a person doesn't know how to pray for it, pray as they should. It's called a weakness. That the Holy Spirit comes and what? He takes hold with them. Are you following me? Grabs a hold with them. He doesn't do it for them, but he gets a hold with them. And all things work out for the good of those who love him and called according to his purpose. God begins to work. God begins to move. As, we, as he's responding, as he's responding to the Holy Spirit helping us pray. He just begins to respond. He begins to move and things begin to shift. Things begin to work. Things begin to happen. You see, when you pray in the Spirit, when you pray in tongues, you may not know exactly what you're praying, but you will know why you're praying. You can know why. I'll give you this example. Um, several years ago, when we were pastoring out west, we um, built a facility. 
And um, so I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, go ahead and buy the long story. I'm not going to go into it all, but buy the materials first. It was a steel frame building. So we, 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 bought, all, we bought the materials first. <laughs> the problem was we didn't have any land. <laughs> I know that's backwards, right? You're supposed to buy land and then buy the stuff. But I just felt like, and long story, I'll tell it one day and how God, why God showed us to do that. But we needed to find land. I felt like, I felt like there was some property out in a certain area of town, and um, I, we would just pray. I would pray with my understanding. And there were times that I would just shift, and i just pray in the Spirit. Now, I knew why I was praying in the Spirit. I was praying about that land. I knew what I, knew what I was praying for. I knew what I was praying about. So just kept praying, stayed persistent, drove around different parts of the city. One day I'm driving uh, in, the, in the area where I felt like we were supposed to build at. Driving in the area, I'm driving over an overpass, and there was a 26-acre lot. There had been a for sale sign out there, but it had gotten blown down. And I hadn't seen it because it had gotten blown down. Matter of fact, I wouldn't have seen it if I wouldn't have been looking in the right place at the right time. So I saw it, and I pulled over, and I thought, somebody's probably already bought it. Somebody's probably already bought it. But I'll call anyway. I crawled over the fence, went out there, got the dirt off of it, standing there, called them on my cell phone, and said, said hey, I'm standing in this prop- on your property right now. Is it still for sale? They said, yeah. How much do you want for it? They told me. I said, well, I'm going to negotiate, but that's a pretty good deal. And then, then I said, um, I said uh, look, would you sell it to a church? And they said, yeah. Long story short, we got the property. As a matter of fact, today, I was there not long ago. Today, uh, there, it was kind of out of the edge of town, and people were like, why are we building out here? I said, the day's going to come when there's going to be a lot more stuff around here. I was back there uh, not long ago, and there's a brand-new high school right by the property. There are new subdivisions right by the property. There's uh, new hotels right by the property. You know, how, you know how we found that? You know how we found that? Just staying persistent. And even when we didn't know how to pray with an understanding, we just shifted over to the other method and said, we're just going to pray in the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray in the Spirit. We're going to pray in tongues. And you know what? God moved. I could stand here all night long, hour after hour after hour, and tell you story after story after story. Now, one of the things that the enemy has, has, one of the lies that the enemy has sown is this, that it's not for everybody. That being filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking tongues is not for everybody. That's not true. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that the, 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 the disciples were in the upper room. When the Holy Spirit came into the upper room, it says he filled all of them. Every single one of them. But even after that, we see that the Holy Spirit was still available. It just wasn't for that group. Because in Acts chapter 19, Paul was walking along one day, and he sees a group of disciples, and he asked them, have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? He said, no, I've never heard of it. He said, let me pray for you. He prayed for them, laid hands on them. Guess what happened? They prayed in tongues. They prayed in the Spirit. Thanks for listening to the Word of Life Center podcast. You can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter or at our website, wordoflifecenter.org.